I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, the aftermath of last week's annual APAC National Policy Conference that was held in Washington, D.C. Some 18,000 pro-Israel activists attended this year's conference, 4,000 of whom were college students, 4,000 college students. And no surprise, the policy conference was not without controversy, in large measure due to expressions of extreme partisan politics that simply amplified the rather hateful rhetoric that characterizes political discourse today. What made the rhetoric all the more ironic was that it was in contrast to the theme of this year's APAC policy conference, which was unity. Many voices, one mission. Well, one journalist who covered the APAC policy conference from gavel to gavel, and many of the informal moments as well, is the superb Washington bureau chief of the JTA, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, a man who is extremely appreciated here on JBS by me and by you, the JBS audience, Ron Campius. And Ron, thank you so much for joining us again. It's always a pleasure. So, Ron, first of all, what was the mood of this year's conference? You know, there you are with 18,000 people, 4,000 college students. At the same time, there are many in the Jewish community who feel there's a cloud over America with Donald Trump. It's a, you, you read it in, in Jewish newspapers all the time. What was the mood of those who came to the conference? I think it was like a it was a mixed mood in the sense that uh, there were you know this is a a conference of, of Jews who don't really focus on the issues that have concerned the wider Jewish community about Donald Trump. They're more concerned with the uh, this is hyper focused on the Israel issues, and to the degree that before the election and uh, between the election and the inauguration, the Jewish <laughs> sorry community was concerned about. Uh, Donald Trump and Israel issues, he's assuaged that to a considerable degree, principally through the rock star of the conference, Nikki Haley, the ambassador to the United Nations, and uh, through his friendly meeting that he had with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. Still, <coughs> there's a lot of unknowns out there. There are promises that he made that he hasn't made good on. Noticeably, administration officials like Mike Pence didn't really address the Iran nuclear program or what they plan to do about it. But overall, there was a sense of relief that there was no longer the tensions that there had been with the Obama administration. All right. So let's take it step by step. First of all, you mentioned Nikki Haley. The sense I got from people who were there and from you and some of the things you've written, she was one of the highlights of the conference. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. She was a, a rock star, a rock star for the conference. Uh, she... Uh, um, she's just very blunt spoken and she's also like a, you know, I was describing areas where Trump made promises on Israel has yet to kind of fulfill them, but she's fulfilling the promises he's made as far as the UN. She has raised the US pro-Israel profile in that body for sure. Uh, you know, the one example <coughs> is that she, sorry, she, um, helped squash a report, a UN report that likened Israel to an apartheid state. Yes. And by the way, everybody should remember President Obama permitted Resolution 2334 to pass without exercising a U.S. veto. That a resolution, of course, slammed Israel for its settlement policy and branded all settlements as a flagrant violation of international law. And now Nikki Haley comes in and she has said there will not be a repeat of that kind of Many people call it a betrayal, Ron, of the state of Israel. Yeah, she'll, she, she said she would never allow through another uh, resolution that, uh, that she thought was unfair to Israel, was that critical of Israel, for sure. Now, APEC's principal legislati legislative agenda, as you write about it, has to do with the Trump's, uh, Trump administration's attitude towards overall the overall level of foreign aid and how that might impact or contrast with Trump's commitment to maintain the level of foreign aid for Israel. Speak about that for a moment. Yes, that's right. That's, gonna, that's one of the three planks that they took up to the Hill on Tuesday, the final day when they go lobbying. 
They don't want to just protect the $3.1 billion that will go to Israel this year and the $3.8 billion that will start going to Israel next year. They want the overall foreign uh, policy, foreign assistance package protected. And that includes, uh, uh, you know, all the money that goes for aid and assistance to uh, to different countries. That, and, and, and Trump has said that he wants to, to reduce that by about a third, between 28 and 32 percent, depending on how you read it. But not when it comes to Israel aid. Not when that's it. He wants to maintain Israel aid. He wants to slash foreign assistance. And the argument for, you know, at APAC, and it's been this argument for years, they've had it in various contexts, is that it's not good for Israel to, to tweak apart Israel aid from foreign aid. It all yes. has to be part of the same package. It's better yeah. for the United States because, uh, and there are Republicans who are speaking at this conference who agreed with this view, most notably Kay Granger from Texas. They say that it's important to maintain a, a positive U.S. profile in the world, not just uh, uh, not, not just a profile of the U.S. willing to use force when its interests are at stake, but one that is also you know, will relieve famine and that will uh, eradicate disease when its interests are at stake. Yes. So those are uh, those are key issues, um, and uh, and also they, there's a, a concern that if there's too much aid going uh, to Israel relative to other aid, that but you know that gives Israel far too much prominence, and that's not good for Israel either. Okay. Now. It's interesting, Ron. Last year, Donald Trump created a firestorm at APAC when he made this off-the-cuff remark indicating it would be a relief when President Obama's time in office came to an end. Despite the fact that he received a rather cool reception at the start of his address, that remark received a standing ovation. So the next day, APAC President Lillian Pincus went to the APAC stage to reprimand Donald Trump and all those in attendance who had shared his statement. Here's how the Washington Post reported what they called an unprecedented moment at APAC. Choking back tears, Pincus apologized for Monday night's speeches, implying that Donald Trump had violated a nonpartisan standard. Now, Ron, you wrote a column for the JTA last Tuesday in which you described in great detail the extent to which APAC speeches were riddled with partisan attacks against now President Trump. You talked about Senator Chuck Schumer, who linked Donald Trump to Charles Lindbergh, Representative Nancy Pelosi. You described how she read an open letter to the president, signed almost exclusively, you say, by Democrats, which you also tell us was written by J Street, although Nancy Pelosi never revealed that fact of authorship. I want you to speak for a moment about Schumer and Pelosi, and in general, speak about the partisanship you go out of your way to describe in the JTA. Uh, I think the partisanship was much more pronounced on the Rep Republican side in terms of just open a Jeremiah it's against the Obama administration and eight years of tensions. Uh, uh, I, in fact, I mean, yes, Pelosi was definitely more partisan uh, Menin, Robert Menendez was uh, was was partisan. Schumer was actually kind of restrained. He was uh, that that I, I singled out that Lindbergh th thing because it was an illusion. He didn't even explicitly mention Trump at all in the speech, and he attacked the, the Obama administration for two, three, three, four. Uh, so it was it it was on both sides. And it, there was like just one sort of "Aren't you glad that Obama is gone?" Uh, speech after another from the Republicans. Uh, what I also strove to point out is that APAC itself was very, very vigilant in its own uh, speeches in maintaining bipartisanship and not signaling any preference for one party or another. They really wanted to pr promote uh, bipartisanship at this conference, and maybe the climate in Washington is just a little too parched right now for uh, <laughs> for that kind of thing. Okay. I just wanted to know whether you felt there was some imbalance or inconsistency here. Uh, once again, it's, that it's not so much about principle, but rather about whose ox is being gored, because I did not hear anybody come out in, at APAC criticizing any of the partisan speeches. And although you, you point out, Republicans and Democrats were partisan. When you read, yeah, I, when, I you read also... Ron, when you read Ron Campius, your description of Pelosi is is just frightening, Ron. 
She, uh, yeah, she, uh, I mean, I would say like the, the most partisan thing, ironically, because it's, uh, it's Robert Menendez, who's a favorite Democrat there and who breaks from his party. But he, he really like, he called um, Steve Bannon a white supremacist, which I think is just, it's, it's incorrect. You can't call him a white supremacist. So that was like really out there. Uh, Pelosi just read a, a letter that she, as she pointed out, had been signed by 199 one people, 189 Democrats. So her message was, it was kind of like the Republican messages. We're the better, better party. And, and both that kind of messages. I have to say that Lillian Pincus, when she apologized last year, from what I understood, it was specifically for Donald Trump saying that Obama was the worst president, for, uh, well, the worst thing for Israel, is uh, how I think he put, put it. And it was that kind of level uh, of attack that uh, that sparked uh, uh, sparked the comment, and it's especially uncomfortable when there's a uh, a sitting president involved uh, for them. So yeah, I, I think that the there there was a I mean maybe if you in case you're if, if you're looking at it as like why didn't they mention it last year and they're not why did they mention it last year they're not mentioning it this year it's more like in today's Washington you're trying to get kind of giving up the ghost and they're trying to they're trying to best their best to maintain. What, to preserve whatever part bipartisanship there is. Yes. Um, again, we're going to move on, but I just, when people read what you wrote, what you, how you reported the speech, especially by Nancy Pelosi, it seemed as critical of Trump as Trump was last year of, um, of Obama. And what I also sense was, and I think you wrote about this, that there was a theme throughout the entire APEC conference that there was criticism of the way in which Barack Obama handled specifically Israel, the Resolution 2334, and a feeling that we need to move on. Is that fair or not? I, I would say that it's more divided. The Republicans were hyper-focused on Obama and what they thought were his sins against Israel, and APEC was focused on we need to move on. Okay, so, okay. very good. Yeah. You also write about Rabbi Rick Jacobs, who of course heads the Reform Movement's Union for Reform Congregations. He's known to be on the left. He was critical of APAC for not coming out forcefully for the two-state solution. How do you think those who support APAC feel about the two-state solution now? And do you think a large percentage of those attending this year's policy conference would agree with Jake? with Rick Jacobs' criticism? No, I don't think a large would, a percentage would. I think that they, you, you saw, I don't, you know, APAC is not, has not abandoned the two-state solution by any means. You can still find it on its website. Howard Decor, the executive director, uh, raised it in a, in a, you know, the one mention it had from an APAC official the entire event. He talked about it. Uh, and there were certainly um, breakout sessions that were focused on uh, preserving the two-state solution. But uh, there's no great enthusiasm. They want to see the Palestinians come forward with their own, uh, you know, with their own concessions before they get back to talking about a two-state solution. I think that was what was uh, the mood that's prevalent among your uh, your average APAC rank and file. And obviously, uh, you know, the organizations that are on the left as well, uh, the Reform Movement, the uh, uh, Americans for Peace Now, J Street are always all about the two-state solution, but because of what's going on in Israel, because Trump, President Trump has retreated from explicitly endorsing the two-state solution, there's kind of alarm in the Jewish center, and that's not reflected at APAC. And I think that that's what, uh, uh, you know, that's what Rick Jacobs wanted to see. He wanted to see a more pronounced uh, commitment to the two-state solution. By the way, there are people who criticize APAC for being having morphed into a right-wing Jewish organization, a Republican Jewish organization is how it's often described. Ron, to what extent is that an accurate description of where APAC is today? Uh, you know, I don't think it's right. I think that they really do try strive for, in terms of the professional leadership, I would say maybe more members of the board are probably Democrats than Republicans, and they're getting attacked by Republicans. They're getting hit by Republicans for, for like for the, for maintaining their uh, their commitment to the uh, to the two state solution. I think if you look at the you know at surveys over the years of the American Jewish Committee uh, and other groups, APEC may be slightly to the right of the American Jewish population, but not that far to the right of the American Jewish population, and that. 
you know, when, when, for instance, um, uh, Menendez talked about uh, Bannon as a white supremacist, there were cheers in the audience. It wasn't, certainly wasn't the whole audience, but there was this significant portion of the audience that uh, rose up in, in cheers. So, you know, that's what I think that the, the your average eight-back activist who's at that conference thinking only, only of Israel, but that phrase triggered in, among some of them, among the Democrats and the liberals, perhaps, the part of the brain that said, oh, yeah, we have to focus on that as well. So they were there. They were present. You know, they, uh, APAC is still seen very much as the most effective way of advancing Israel's interests. There's just no, there's no other group that matches its influence, uh, whatever, you know, whether both sides now, uh, Republicans and uh, J Street are trying to challenge that. And they, there's, their APAC's not exactly leaving a vacuum. Yes. Okay, Ron, you also write that there was a lot of criticism leveled against President Obama's Iran nuclear deal. Right. Describe how that played out at APEC. It's just that it was considered a bad deal, that the Iran is, um, is violating its terms, although it's actually not violating its terms, but it hasn't stopped Iran from being emboldened in the Middle East uh, in terms of its backing for terrorism and in terms of its uh, uh, ballistic missile testing. But interestingly, um, there, was, there was actually a a breakout session on this that I didn't attend, but overall in the plenaries and in other areas, nobody actually had suggestions about what to do to uh, to to ameliorate the deal or to replace the deal. Uh, president Trump, as president so far, has shown no appetite for replacing the deal. There's talk about tougher enforcement. The one kind of actual particular that came out was when Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said that uh, should Iran ever advance towards uh, weaponizing its nuclear program, he will lead the authorization in con Congress for a military strike, in other words, a war authorization. Yes. But uh, that's not happening soon, I don't think. Yes. Is the sense in the room and the sense in among APAC leadership that the Iran deal has failed, or do they feel that regardless of what weaknesses it may have, it's turning out to be a successful attempt to keep Iran from getting a nuclear weapon? I think, you know, the, the, the line in APAC is, is actually, it's not exactly either of those. It's Benjamin Netanyahu's line that the success of the Iran nuclear deal is actually worse for Israel than the failure in that in 10 years, a lot of the provisions lapse, and then Iran gets to legally, or, you know, can, can choose in that case to illegally do things that would advance towards a nuclear program. That's what's concerning them. And nobody's and, you know, Paul Ryan mentioned that in his speech. He said in 10 years they do this. Nobody's saying exactly how you how you stop that from happening, how you, you know, make it 15 years or 20 years or, or an eternity. They're just pointing it out as something that they, uh, they don't like about the deal. Yes. Okay, you also write about BDS. And APAC's agenda also addressed the BDS movement. Can you speak about how BDS was, in fact, part of this conference? Oh, it was a major part of this contra conference. There were lots of sessions on it. Every speaker, Democrat and Republican, raised it and said they were opposed to it. Part of oh, you know, one of the th one of the reflections of Israel of APEC's attempt to be bipartisan is that every all three things that the activists were bringing to do that had bipartisan backing. And one of those things is a uh, a bill uh, backed by Rob Portman, Republican of Ohio, and uh, Ben Cardin, Democrat of Maryland, that would. Uh, attached to uh, anti-boycott laws, BDS. In other words, all those laws that exist from the 1970s that made it illegal to cooperate with the Arab League boycott of Israel would now be attached to anybody who, any business, American business, that cooperated with a, a formal uh, BDS-led boycott of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, you also make the point that it was interesting that Black Lives Matter was not an issue that was raised at APAC, and at one point you, you describe um, a session that was uh, cr created all out of the plenaries. I think it was a, an informal meeting, an informal party that uh, Rabbi Block created, and it had to do with race relations, but it struck you that Black Lives Matter was not part of the agenda. Speak to that for a moment. Oh, yeah, I think that you know the Black Lives Matter movement which is kind of uh, diverse and diffuse and doesn't really have a centralized thing, nonetheless has been tainted by this platform 
that's not necessarily reflective of the whole movement, but that talks about BDS and Palestine and Israel and Israeli human rights, etc. And so there is a thirst, I think, on the uh, in the pro-Israel movement. And it's Rabbi Block's son, Josh Block, who actually initiated this. They want African American partners uh, that they can work with that aren't going to raise these kinds of issues. You know what's known as intersectionality. And they had a very interesting group there called 2020, uh, and it's a it's a group of uh, bipartisan group of African American legislators and mayors, uh, and they say that they modeled on APAC in terms of being bipartisan, and they want to advance prison reform justice. And they were sort of saying, you know, we back you on the pro-Israel stuff, and there were speeches about why they backed uh, Israel. But they said we need your support on prison reform because of the inequities in prison reform. For instance, one in every three black males will be imprisoned at one point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, Ron, again, we know that the Jewish community votes Democratic, 70 percent and more. One of the main speakers, I think he was in the, at the beginning of the entire policy conference, was the Vice President of the United States, uh, Mike Pence. How was he received? Because I know there are many in the Jewish community who have no love for either Trump or Pence. What was the tone when the vice president addressed the plenary? You know, Pence actually has a very good relationship with the pro-Israel community. You're right, in the broader Jewish community, there are problems, certainly nothing compared to the problems that there are with uh, Donald Trump, with, with, uh, with Mike Pence, because of some of his, uh, his legislative initiatives in when he was governor of Indiana, particularly having to do with, uh, with gays. But in terms of pro-Israel, it's just like big admiration for the guy. The guy, he's been there from the beginning, from the beginning of his congressional career, very passionate about Israel. And as governor, he, you know, he pushed through one of the first anti-BDS laws, I think the first in a state, actually, um, yeah, that actually had teeth. And so just a, a very warm reception for Pence. So it's interesting. There is affection for Mike Pence in the pro-Jewish community in general, correct? Yeah, yeah, I think there is. And not only that, I mean, I think if anything, I mean, I didn't get this necessarily at the APAC conference, but if anything, since, uh, you know, he took, he was at the forefront of speaking out against uh, what seemed to be anti-Semitic attacks. And, you know, so he went, he actually traveled. So when they went over a close to 150 or close to 200 tombstones were toppled in the St. Louis area Jewish cemetery. And, you know, that have, that was reported on Friday and, and, it, and it took until Monday for President Trump to mention it. And it was in a statement. It wasn't Trump himself. You had Mike Pence actually traveling to Indiana, taking a, a rake and starting to cleaning, cleaning up there. That, you know, that, that's the kind of image that really, really resonates with the, with the Jewish community. Uh, and so he has that affection, I think. Absolutely. Okay, Prime Minister Netanyahu addressed APAC by satellite. How was the prime minister received? Very well, as always. You know, he's uh, this, he's popular at uh, at APAC. There's uh, th that no question that he uh, that his messaging, that his praise for the organization goes down well. You know, obviously it's a little different when you're watching a video link. You don't get that electric charge when somebody's actually in the room. But he was he was received very well. It is striking. The president of the United States did not show up. The prime minister of Israel did not show up. Should we read into that, read anything into either of those two things? You know, the prime minister is dealing with a, um, first of all, with a, a government crisis, one of his own making, frankly, but it's still a government crisis, and that's the kind of thing that keeps you, in, uh, keeps you at home, and it has done in the past. I mean, there's, a, there's always been an expectation. Why isn't the prime minister here? Why is, there's, for a year, there are lots and lots of years where prime ministers of Israel have not come to APAC because they've had other things to deal with at home. But the other thing is true. It's also they had their summit in February. It was just a month ago or a little over a month ago. And they, you know, they have some unresolved things as to exactly how um, what the Trump administration position will be on settlements, whether there'll be a revived uh, Israeli-Palestinian process, what the dimensions of it will be. And by the way, Jason Greenblatt's just doing fantastic, fantastic work in the in the region, I think, in, in terms of uh, of just getting the confidence of everybody who's uh, who would be a party to that process if it is revived. But it's not resolved yet. So, 
you know, it's kind of like you come for a date, but there's nothing to talk about. <laughs> so yes. I think that might have had a bit of factor in it as well. I understand. So sum it up for us as you, you know, you see the sweep of the policy conference this year. Do you think APAC felt that it was a successful conference? And again, last year there was some real contention and there was disappointment. Was this a successful APAC conference, do you believe, in terms of how the APAC leadership viewed it? I think they, could, they would write this off as a success for sure. Like I said, there was a kind of open-endedness about the conference. Howard Kaur is one of the best speakers out there, and he usually has like a lot of really good content in his speech. There's an overarching theme, and this year there just wasn't. It did, and I'm, I think that's simply because regarding the uh, President Trump himself, a lot is open-ended on Israel. Uh, people, like I said, are happier with him than they were with his predecessor, but it's still, uh, it's still kind of open-ended. And so maybe, you know, that, that helped uh, tamp down a huge amount of enthusiasm. On the other hand, I think one of the measures of a, of a successful APAC conference is a robust uh, legislative agenda, and they certainly had that this year. That's a superb summary for us, Ron. It is always wonderful when I can turn to you and get your perspective, and you always are both incisive and lovely, and I appreciate your making time for us. We will continue to call you. Call to Hatzlacha. Keep up the good work. We will talk very soon again. Okay, thank you. Be well. Ron Campius, Washington Bureau Chief of the JTA, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, giving us an overview of the 2017 APEC National Policy Conference. And for those of you who weren't able to be in Washington for APEC, but would like to have been, you can share in every moment right here on JBS. We'll be showing some of the highlight speeches every evening this week, and next week we'll be televising the plenary sessions in their entirety, entirety so you can enjoy every moment. My thanks, as always, to our director, Sloan Copeland, production coordinator, Serge Goldberg, JBS's associate director, Dara Golub, editors, Dennis Golan and John McDevitt, and to the producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. <laughs> <laughs>